I'm really pleased that we assembled a panel of people who have very different perspectives on the film. Uh, starting here on the right, my colleague Don Cohn, who was uh, in the beginning stages of the crisis uh, at the vice chairman of the Federal Reserve uh, Board and uh, lived some of those sleepless nights. Um, he's responsible for everything that worked well and not responsible for anything that failed. <laughs> Uh, Neil Irwin of the New York Times is one of uh, a handful of journalists who've written just terrific books on the crisis. His is called The Alchemists, and it's about the international um, side of this thing, which is uh, extraordinary in a sense you don't get in the film, but just how much this is affecting the rest of the world. Wendy Edelberg, who is here because she was the executive director of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, which provided a lot of fodder for the film and for those of us who tried to figure out what the heck just happened. Uh, she's now at CBO, but she's really here in her, uh, her, uh, her past role as executive director of that commission. John Maggio, who's the director of the film and can tell us, like, how did you get all those people to talk to you and how did you get that document, that handwritten thing where they write in $25 billion, it looks like a check at, uh, at, uh, at, at uh, Friendly's or something. And then our moderator is going to be uh, Catherine Rampell, who's an excellent columnist from the Washington Post. Uh, my hope is that we can hear a little bit about what people think about this narrative, about the importance of narrative in general, and what lessons do we draw from this. Uh, we're a little behind schedule, but I think we're going to uh, we'll go. Catherine will lead the panel for about 25 minutes or so, and then we'll have a few minutes at the end for questions from the audience, not as many as we'd like. Um, so with that, Catherine, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks very much uh, to our esteemed panelists and to all of you for sticking around, including after the film has, uh, the main event, the film has ended. Um, I wanted to start uh, with a question for John, actually, about what struck you as most surprising in your work on this film or what changed your perception the most uh, of what happened 10 years ago, in particular because the rest of us on the panel were living with it uh, more intensively at the time, uh, either as journalists or as policymakers or, or otherwise, and you came to this with fresher eyes. So what was surprising to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I came to this, like, I really, you know, I, I lived it in as much as I bought my first home in, like, 2004, and then I sold it in 2008. And I remember the, I remember the experience of looking for a house, and at first it was just real estate agents, and then it was, like, mortgage brokers at the open houses, and I bought one of those 5-1 arms. And so I kind of had lived the financial crisis in some way. But I'm not a I'm not a financial reporter. I'm not, a, I'm not I don't make those kinds of films necessarily. So for me, what I was struck by and what I wanted to hopefully sort of achieve was two things: so a that there were human beings behind all of these decisions. I mean, I remember you know like like everybody's memory have little snatches of moments of of bipartisanship of seeing Hank hearing the Hank story going down on his knees. You know, there were all the sort of familiar chestnuts, but it was all this stuff and the sort of you know, the, the sleepless nights that these guys went through and, and, and the sort of, you know, kind of really just coming at it feeling like, yeah, why did we bail these guys up? What the hell was going on? And, and sort of really kind of steeping myself in that, in, in the story. Um, but really it was the humanity behind it that I'm, as a filmmaker, always most interested in and was really my warrant was to try to kind of, um, you know, you all do such a great job explaining what the economics were, but I wanted to connect people emotionally. Um, and so the fact that they, those three guys really kind of trusted me, I spent a lot of time with them, and I think it shows in the film, they opened up, and even, you know, people like President Bush, um, you know, uh, Rahm Emanuel, everybody was very emotional, everybody kind of let their guard down, President Obama as well, you know, who, who does tend to really concentrate on every word, kind of let his guard down a little bit too. There's something about maybe the, the 10 years that have gone by allowed them to be a little bit more honest. So that, for me, was, was the most interesting part of it. And, Wendy, were there parts of um, events 10 years ago or in the lead-up uh, to the actual crisis itself that you think uh, weren't, that were important, that were not um, emphasized in this narrative, or do you think that might be left out of other narratives? I mean, and there have been many, of course, books and films and panels, amongst other uh, genres. So I think that the film did a great job capturing the, the lack of transparency that was in the financial system and the interconnectedness and the, the, uh, uh, the liquidity risk that different, the different firms were holding. Um, I worry that there's 
that we draw too much of a straight line in most of the narratives between the leverage in the household sector and the leverage in the financial system. They seem like they're, they're of the same piece, but I don't think they are. And, and, it, and it, so one of the ways to think about that is that the leverage in the household sector created a lot of losses of real estate wealth. Those should not have been large enough to bring down a financial system. So the, the losses in housing wealth between, say, 2007 and the beginning of 2009 were smaller than the losses in the, the bust of the, in the, in the dot-com bust. And, and yet, those, those two different burstings of bubbles had very different implications for the financial system. And I think that's when you get to, well, it's because of, well, I think largely because of the leverage in the financial system. And so I, I worry that we conflate the two kinds of leverage, and, and they're very different, and they have very different policy responses, I think. And what about in terms of the, the policy of response of them, themselves? Is there something that, uh, I don't know, has been untapped or unexplored or misunderstood in the way that they've been covered? So I think, I mean, so again, I think if you look at, if you look at what, at the problems that we saw uh, in, the, in, the, in the household sector, in the, in the mortgage sector, um, there have been, you know, there's been a fulsome policy response to that. Um, and then if you look at the financial system, that's just, it's just a lot more complicated. Um, and I think, I think one thing is that, uh, is that we've taken a, a, a different view of regulation. I think that uh, we were talking earlier about, about what it means to have stress tests, what it means for, for regulators to come to a financial institution and say, you say you have good, regular, you say you have good risk management practices, um, you, know, you say your house is in order, but uh, we're going to bring in uh, some external expertise to come to our own determination about that. I think that's a... That's a, I would argue that's a different way of, of, of thinking about regulation than we had in the years leading up to the financial crisis. Uh, Neil, one of the themes of the film, as well as many other discussions that occur around this subject, is that it could have been much worse, right? Um, that had the Fed and, and uh, Treasury and Congress not taken the extraordinary measures that it did, that those things did, uh, that we could have had another Great Depression. Um, I'm wondering if you've thought at all about a different kind of counterfactual, right? We, we've heard about the counterfactual that things could have been worse. Is there a universe in which things could have been better? Are there things that policymakers could have done that would have landed us on a different course than we, we are on now, and, and a better one? So there's two versions of that. There's in an ideal world with very wise, knowing policymakers throughout the system, not just at the Federal Reserve, uh, but throughout Congress and uh, uh, everywhere, uh, with great foresight, could there be a better outcome? Uh, obviously, <laughs> uh, there's no reason an economy has to go through what we've been through uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, and you know, you can imagine a world, even if you did have, first of all, you can imagine better regulation on the front end that prevented this overlevered financial system from building up and all these imbalances from, from building. You can imagine then if you failed at that, the crisis comes along, maybe passing the TARP not after the Lehman failure, but, but before it. If you talk to Don or Ben Bernanke or Hank Paulson, they'll tell you there was no political way in the world they were going to get that kind of authority except in an emergency setting, which is what ended up happening. Um, so in some perfect world, uh, obviously there's a, there's a way to avoid this. I think the, the challenge is Given the actual political dynamics at play, um, were the tactical decisions that you guys made um, sound and leave us in a better place than we would have been? I, you know, I, I realize plenty of people disagree with that around the world, around the country, uh, but I think there's a, a pretty strong case that, uh, that, that all things considered, we ended up in a good spot. Uh, so speaking of politics, Don, um, I know you are not a politician, but one of the frequent criticisms of the handling of the crisis is, uh, in a sense, political. It's that the that policymakers did not sufficiently explain or communicate what they were doing. That the things that they were doing um, were ob inherently objectionable, but could have been more politically palatable, um, both at the time and in retrospect, ten years on, uh, and that would have 
A, saved us a lot of headache at the time, and B, maybe prevented this populist uprising that we subsequently saw on both the left and the right uh, afterward. When I've talked with other policymakers who were involved at the time, like uh, former Secretary Geithner, they've said, no, it's just inherently irreconcilable that the things that you have to do to break a panic are fundamentally at odds with what American values are. Uh, and that there is no way that you could have sold that as good to the public then or in retrospect. Where do you come down on that question? So I think I'm not uh, quite as pessimistic as Tim about that. Uh, maybe I'm an optimist uh, that, and we could have done a better job of explaining things. And I think explaining them to ordinary people, I think a really uh, good moment for me was Ben Bernanke going on 60 Minutes and walking through his hometown and explaining how what he did related to, and you saw pictures, his uncle's pharmacy and uh, how he, he had this in mind, saving Main Street when we were saving Wall Street. And the reason we saved Wall Street was Main Street. And I don't think that message got across hardly at all through the crisis. Now, it was really hard because you were working... 20, 24 hours a day fixing things up and trying to come up with the ways of keeping the panic from spreading and keeping the system from freezing up even worse. But I think it would have been uh, helpful, at least to some extent, to have uh, more people out there uh, in authority, explaining more clearly why this was necessary. Yes, it was inherently objectionable to do some of the things that we had to do, but they were done with a reason. And um, I think my advice for policymakers in the next crisis, and I hope it's many, many years from now, is to think more carefully about that communic about that communication piece. Okay. One complication yeah. on that. What's striking to me and really surprised me during this period is that some of the things that were less Wall Street targeted and more targeted at Main Street at real people also became deeply unpopular. Right. Any kind of homeowner assistant, uh, assistance, uh, the fiscal stimulus, right. these were things that were much less Wall Street, and, uh, and yet the entire Tea Party thing started with... Um, that Rick Santelli rant. That was a big surprise to me. I didn't, uh, the Santelli rant, I, I'd forgotten about that, but you realize it was in response to a program to help the homeowner. And that just, I don't, didn't, I couldn't square that. And, and it was a big, <laughs> I had forgotten all about that part of it. But it is true. And I also think, I mean, Ben makes this point, he made this point to me off camera, which is that there was a little bit of a lag between the crisis and panic on Wall Street and actually feeling it on, on Main Street. Right. And so we weren't necessarily. I don't understand why everybody was panicking. It would come. It would come after Obama's election and, and in various ways with deeper recession as the economy uh, contracted. But, you know, I don't think we were feeling it. Until you feel something, you know, you can't really understand it. And it was as hard as you maybe tried to communicate that. It wasn't going to come And across. I think what, what Neil pointed out is part of this Old Testament justice, the U.S. way is when if you make money, you get to enjoy it. If you lose it, you lose it. And I think part of this reaction on the homeowner's side was, and I, I had several encounters with cab drivers and others through this period, and even before in late 2007, early 2008, in which they said, I'm working overtime, I'm driving my cab so I can make my mortgage. Why should my taxes go to help my neighbor, who isn't working as hard, to make his or her mortgage? So there was the same kind of Old Testament justice issue with homeowners. Well, there's, there's a slightly different version of that argument as well, which has to do with moral hazard, right? Which is the idea that if people learn the lesson that they will be bailed out, then they'll behave more irresponsibly next time around. Right. And, and Wendy, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit uh, about uh, what you think the lasting legacy of these bailout programs would be or, or how regulators think about them in, in terms of moral hazard? Or, or was there concern about that at the time? So I think po uh, policymakers' responses to, to adverse financial events, I mean, 
those, those have been going on since, since the Great Depression, and policymakers have worried about moral hazard since, since they set up you know, uh, the FDIC. So, so that's nothing new. I think, um, I, I think the system became partly more fragile because it, you, I think since the Great Depression, for, for many, many decades, we really had two different financial systems that were working in parallel. We had the traditional banking system, we had the shadow banking system. And it's true that in, in, in some ways they both had access to, to, the, to help by policymakers. I mean, really more the traditional banking system, but, but, but partly the shadow banking system as well. But they also could help each other. And there were, another, there were a number of circumstances where there were financial shocks that occurred in, in, in either the traditional banking sector or the shadow banking sector, and the other system came to the rescue and bailed it out. And it was, it was like the spare tire theory was, was, was one of the phrases that was coined. And, and what happened in the, in the, let's say, 20 years leading up to the financial crisis is both systems became more and more similar over time and more and more exposed to basically the exact same, uh, had exposure to the exact same kinds of assets and were doing the exact same kinds of things. So, so now there was no sense in which they were going to be able to bail each other out if something bad happened in one system or the other system. Now the only, the only place that both systems could turn was to policymakers. And, and I think that's, that's where, that's perhaps where the worries <clears throat> about moral hazard become, become more severe. Uh, so, John, on the question of legacy, uh, quite literally in the film, we have uh, a number of the key players talking about their concerns about their legacies. I don't, they don't talk about moral hazard per se, but they talk about, I don't want to be remembered as Hoover, I don't want to be remembered as Mellon, et cetera. Um, how much do you think that those kinds of concerns about legacy as opposed to fixing the problem at hand, like putting out the fire right now, um, as opposed to how I'll be remembered for putting out the fire. How much do you think that informed their thinking um, for good or for ill? And did they succeed in securing a positive legacy for themselves? Towards well, the end of the film, it didn't seem like they believed that. I, you know, well, that's up to the audience to decide, I guess, and, and, and you know, historians in the future. But, I mean, that was definitely one of the reasons I think they wanted to do this, because of the reasons of not really ever feeling that they've ever fully communicated it. I mean, one of the big things that they wanted to get across, too, which, you know, I, I, we do in the film, is that, you know, it was a success in that there was no taxpayer money lost. I mean, actually, the taxpayer actually made money. And I remember telling them, well, why don't you ever talk about that? Well, that, that there's an argument to be made that I'll let economists and others sort of have, but, but it's a message they wanted to try to get out. Um, and I think that this, doing this film was, a big, was very much an important part of trying to sort of have a corrective, even though there's been you know, many, many projects done. One of those I will tell you that I still have questions about, um, which I still think they're puzzling over what the answer is, is about Lehman. Um, and you know, at various points of, of getting to know these guys and talking about them and working through questions was whether or not they could actually have the authority to lend to Lehman because there was no collateral there. And that seemed to me, there are a lot of people who are curious about that. I interviewed Adam Tooze, who's not in the film, but you know, made the point to me that you know, at this time, the government was finding value in all sorts of garbage. And why couldn't they have find, found value in Lehman Brothers? So Lehman Brothers, I think, is going to remain a thorn in their side. I mean, we talk about the politics of it. Uh, I allowed Ben said we could have lent, but it was already too far gone. So Lehman remains this thing. I don't think they fully have captured what the narrative will be into the future. I still think it's a, it's a question mark. At least it is for me. Can I jump in for a second? Sure. So I'm, I'm not sure that, that making money is the right metric, that getting a positive return is the right metric. I think it might be for the people who, who look at it. But, I, <laughs> but if, if uh, Ben Bernanke is hesitant in pushing that narrative, I am sympathetic to that hesitancy. I mean, so so policymakers took a risk, and I and and maybe it and 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 maybe it paid off financially. But that's that's not 
generally speaking, what we think the role of government should be. If we thought that was the role of government, there's lots of, there's, there's lots of projects that the government could be investing in, lots of risky financial projects the government could be investing in that would have a positive return. So, so I'm not sure that the fact that, that, that we came out making money makes it ex post a good thing. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think uh, if like you, Don wants to win, the too. populist argument would be, I mean, I think, I don't know if that's a palliative to people, but it's a message they were sharing with me. So I, I agree with Wendy that whether you made money or not isn't the criteria. The criteria is whether you stabilized the system and kept the credit or return the ability of the financial system to support U.S. households and businesses as they went about their economic business, stabilized the situation, and began the recovery. That's the right criteria. However, I think the fact that the government made money, that the Fed didn't lose any money on these loans, suggested that they weren't giveaways. It wasn't as if we were throwing money at folks. These were uh, investments in banks the Treasury was making, uh, and the banks were sufficiently solvent once the crisis and the panic had abated to go out and raise money and repay the government. The Federal Reserve was taking collateral and, and trying to value it as if the when the panic subsides, what's this going to be worth? And in fact, the panic subsided and the collateral was worth uh, more than the loan was. And the Fed ended up getting all the loans repaid and making a little bit of money. But the making a little bit of money isn't important. I think what is important is that this wasn't just throwing money at rich people or rich corporations. It was making loans, buying assets in order to stabilize the situation to help households and businesses. I think for me, one of sort of the tragedies, a more incidental tragedy, a more minor tragedy, but a tragedy nonetheless of uh, the financial crisis and, and how it's remembered today is that um, these policymakers in many ways did things that were quite politically courageous at the time. Um, not only in doing things that they knew the public was going to object to, but even the little things behind the scenes. Like I thought one of the more striking details in the film was when Rahm Emanuel is talking about the blood oath, that they weren't going to use Hank Paulson's dry heaving for political advantage. Um, and, and Neil, I'm just wondering, given where our politics are today, um, do you see any of that? as possible, or is there a way we could get back you know, just, on a path? And, and it's not like things were so hunky-dory back then. No, it was it, very politically divisive. All I could think of watching that and watching, uh, you know, the video of Bush and, and Pelosi and Harry Reid and uh, that crowd as they worked with each other, that there was real respect there. Now, though, you know, Nancy Pelosi and George Bush had extremely different politics, and, um, you know, I don't think they liked each other, but uh, but they were able to sit in a room and work together. And I contrast that with what we saw this morning <laughs> when the Pelosi and Chuck Schumer were in the White House and it was uh, just a very strange scene. Uh, you know, if, now, this is an unusual president. Are we in a political environment where there's such deep polarization that if there is a financial crisis, a war, something geopolitical, who knows, uh, that there can be a kind of uh, deal-making process? First of all, is there that in this next two or six years uh, with the current president? And uh, when he's gone, will, uh, will that return? Uh, I want to hope so, but uh, it's a def definitely not the world that we saw in that video from only 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think it's deeply, the reaction is deeply roaring that in the next crisis, they won't, the tools won't be there. It'll be even harder to get the capital that's going to be necessary to, could be necessary to stop a deep crisis. It'll be harder for the Federal Reserve to make the loans, particularly to non-banks, that might be necessary in a deep crisis. So it's going to require more, really, political backing and more understanding to get this done. And the, the reaction is, is worrisome about... Some tools were given to the policymakers, the orderly resolution and Dodd-Frank, 
Um, certainly the ability to stress test the banks on a regular basis, et cetera. But I think the general political environment would be so averse to doing anything similar, at least until these memories die out, that uh, the next set of poor guys and gals that are faced with this are going to be uh, faced with a, a more difficult situation. Well, on the point about uh, powers being taken away from uh, the Fed as a result of Dodd-Frank following um, the crisis, um, how much were you thinking about that at the time when you were taking these extra, you know, taking measures that you knew were extraordinary? That was the term that was even used then. Um, when you were, fa- when you were, you know, sort of dealing with multiple audiences, that's another theme of the film: the audience of Congress, the audience of Wall Street, and then there's the audience of the American public. Mm-hmm. How much were you thinking about? Well, if we do these things, there's going to be so much blowback that maybe the Fed will have its wings clipped. Um, and not be like the long term consequences, not just again, I, putting up I, the I didn't think about that at all. I thought, here are these tools, these instruments, we've got to use them. And we've got to do, we've got to explain. And perhaps, as I said before, we didn't do as good a job on that as we should have. But I, it didn't occur to me that I somehow should. Um, draw back and not do everything absolutely possible permitted under the law to stabilize the financial system and begin the recovery of the economy. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Neil, I'm also wondering in in terms of what skills would be or skills or tools would be necessary. Another one of the themes of the film was that um, the three key players at the time. Bernanke, Paulson, and Geithner all brought different strengths that turned out that complemented each other. You know, obviously none of them were perfect, but they, to some extent, compensated for each other's weaknesses. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on whether the skill sets that might be necessary the next time around would be different. Hmm. I mean, <laughs> you know, nobody, nobody is uh, is perfectly prepared for what, whatever the next crisis is. By definition, these crises happen when lots of things get intertangled with each other that are hard to predict. If it's easy to predict, it's probably not uh, not going to be a crisis uh, because systems adjust. Um, that everybody knew there was, a lot of people thought there might be a housing bubble in 2005. I don't think too many people understood how that housing bubble was propping up uh, the entire uh, you know global financial system and where all that debt that was risky was actually buried and how it could spread and how it could metamorphosize. Um, that's a way of saying that uh, I don't think there's any one resume, any one type of experience. I think you want policymakers who are uh, open-minded, who are curious about the world, who are open to changing. You know, one thing that strikes me about uh, the, the three lead characters here and a lot of the people I covered during that time is uh, they did not let their ideology and their, and their predispositions um, uh, overwhelm their ability to kind of analyze the situation and react accordingly. Um, Hank Paulson was a Goldman Sachs guy a business guy, he's a Republican, uh, he didn't want to do this stuff. Um, uh, there was a real willingness to say, okay, what's the actual problem? Let's, let's follow the evidence and try and do something about it. Um, and I think we have to hope that we have people with similar instincts in the next crisis. I think yeah. I, just uh, if I could add to that, I mean, part of the, in the process of making the film, I mean, it started to feel a little bit to me, I wanted it to be a pay on, a, a, almost a tribute to public service. Because Hank didn't necessarily even want the job. You know, and then this happens on his watch. And then, you know, I have to say, even with President Bush, I mean, he did, you know, between 9-11, Katrina, this crisis, I mean, the guy faced a lot of, and, and, you know, and picked good people. I mean, that's, he would say that was his greatest strength, was picking Hank Paulson in that situation. Wendy. So I think the policymakers who deal with the next financial or economic crisis face a very different fiscal situation than the policymakers did in 2007. And um, I think one, one skill set, I mean, as it turns out in the, in the financial crisis, uh, uh, international investors actually turn to the United States rather than away from the United States. And, and it's one of the reasons that interest rates uh, on US treasuries uh, were so low. Um, I would hope that policymakers in the next crisis keep a, keep a watchful eye on on international markets and make sure that we don't, we don't lose the, um, 
lose the trust of international investors. All right, I think we're going to take some questions from the audience. And we're going to do like a maybe three at a time. So um, let's go here first. Thank you. Herb Rose. Um, it was a masterful film, and I really appreciate the job that you did. I thought it was great. One thing uh, that uh, there were differences between the Great Recession and the Great Depression. Um, there were different systemic causes, I think, but one of them was that a lot of people had adjustable mortgages uh, that came due, uh, and that when they originally were granted these mortgages, thought perhaps uh, they could take care of that. Uh, but there was a lot of fraud that was committed, I think, in selling those mortgages. Has anybody been Has anybody been convicted of fraud or any other charge? You didn't really yeah, get you, too much into that. Um, uh, uh, should it, I answer that now? Or? Uh, one second. We're just going to sure. do a few. Okay, back here. Thank you. My name is Peter Shutley, and my question builds on the last one. Was there consideration given to having the Attorney General, Justice Department, bring a suit against some of these top financiers for various malfeasance and things? And if the public had seen, hey, wait a minute, these big cats are being hauled into court because of what they've done, I'm not the only victim of this. And, and if something like that had happened, as it did in the 89-90 um, uh, uh, savings and loan crisis where people were hauled in, that could have s slowed down the public anger. Why wasn't that considered or was it considered? Right here. Thank you. Uh, Carl Golovin. Uh, the point in time in history that most clarifies the situation, Andrew Jackson's farewell address of 1837. If you just Google it, scroll down and read about 2,000 words about why he ended the Second Bank of the U.S., and he warned very almost to the point about all the, the created uh, crises that would be used to try to bring about a third central bank. And uh, in reference to that, uh, a history of central banking and the enslavement of mankind by... Uh, former central banker Stephen Goodson. Uh, in, in essence, the world has transitioned to debt slavery from chattel slavery. And there's no constitutional basis for a central bank making our money a political currency. Steve, uh, you have a question? Yes. The Constitution says gold and silver coin are money. I would ask any of you to tell me, in, according to law, what is the definition today of the meaning of a dollar? What does the word dollar mean? Okay, so we have a couple of questions about um, people being held accountable, particularly by the DOJ, and another one about the meaning of money. Who wants to take either of those? I'll take the, fir I'll take the first one, which is that, um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a book, and I'm sitting down with him tomorrow, written by Jesse Eisinger called The Chicken Shit Club, which I highly recommend because it, it speaks to why justice didn't bring up Bring charges. You know, there's. I think these are, and I and there's pe people who probably can speak more clearly about this, but they're very difficult cases to bring. Well, so I think what that gets you. So the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission did refer cases to justice. These are difficult cases to bring. I think in large part. I mean, I'm by no means a lawyer or a prosecutor or anything like that. I'm an economist, but these cases are difficult to bring because your 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 question assumes that what was being done was flagrantly illegal. And, and I think, I think the, the harder question is, are we okay with a financial system where what was being done was basically legal? So that's harder. It's more complicated. It's thornier. But, but I think that's why you didn't see, you're not seeing as many cases as you might expect. It's these, this was a, all, all of the things that we're talking about in terms of leverage and in terms of, uh, I, I, I'm going to get technical, and I don't want to do that. And all of the things that, that all of the technical things that created this financial system were legal. Um, I, I would also just mention. I was reminded when we were backstage that you know this was this the anniversary of the Madoff scandal breaking. Don't forget that Madoff happened in the middle of this, and I think there was 
I mean, you look, you know, my feeling was when you look at um, someone like Dick Fold in this film, the uh, Lehman Brothers, he seems like the villain, right? I mean, he is the villain in this story. Well, Madoff was also, you know, was a big villain, and I think a lot of people felt like, let's get all these guys. They're all that bad. But to your point, I think they were doing legal things that we are all somewhat buying into. I got a 5-1 arm, and I got out of it before the arm went up, you know, and I think I'm an educated, smart person, thought that I, you know, have a professional career, I've got real estate in New York is always supposed to go up and everything, you know, like everybody, we, we are all sort of kind of, I try to make that point in the beginning, we were all taking a nice sudsy bath in low interest rates in that period. So pivoting very quickly away from, away from the, from the, from the housing sector and back to the financial sector, I mean, so financial institutions were, were creating very, very risky securities that then off-balance sheet entities of those financial institutions were buying. And, and, and that was just a, I mean, I, there are a lot of people in this room who, who will, like, raise their hand and tell me if I'm wrong, if I've, but I, I'm pretty, okay, good. So, <laughs> so that, that, that was a, it was a, it was a self-perpetuating cycle that, you know, they, they created... Well, but it was legal. Okay, 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 okay. It was legal. You'll get your chance. You'll get your chance. Okay, okay. Their turn to talk now. I'll get, to, I'll get to you guys. Okay, I'm continue. Done. You're done. done. Okay. Questions. So uh, on the money oh, yes. question, so yeah. a dollar is what a dollar <laughs> buys, and it's been it's fiat money, right? It's not tied to gold. It's legal, I'm sure. The Congress has passed lots of laws respecting how the Federal Reserve should treat, uh, treat the price level. It's given it a price stability mandate. And I would say that the ability of the Federal Reserve to run an aggressive, stimulative monetary policy from late in, well, really through the whole crisis, and then particularly late in 2008, beginning of 2009, and through the next few years, which a major reason why the economy recovered and recovered as rapidly as it did. Uh, on, the, on the culpability thing, of course, the, the institutions have paid huge fines, but individuals haven't suffered, and I think that's what people miss. Okay. Question right here. Thank you. Larry Checo. I think the movie did a lot of good stuff, but it missed out on a real important part. Where were the chaperones? I didn't hear the SEC mentioned. I didn't hear about um, the credit agencies doing their little bit. There was a lot of missing, a lot of missing in there. And I just, I, the fact that that September 11th, 2018 meeting where all those folks there laughing, there are millions of people out there who are, who are going to spend generations, literally generations, trying to get back what they lost during that recession. And I hope we understand that. We have a lot of people up here who are very influential. They better get that straight. That's why we have Donald Trump. They're, you're right about that. You're absolutely right. People are pissed. Yeah. And I hope the powers that be understand that. Okay. Not a question. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, back there, yep. Hello. Um, just wondering, why is this coming out now? Is there any significance to the timing of the release? And let's take one more. Right here. James Quinn. Uh, the Republicans in Congress and the White House are trying to kill the Consumer Financial Protection Board, and pretty much all of Dodd-Frank. My question is, are they going to be successful, and what is really the impact going to be, and how long is it going to take to recover from what, whatever they accomplish? Okay, so we have a question on the CFPB. We have a question on where were the chaperones, um, and why now for this film? Okay, on the, on the chaperone. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, this wasn't the subject of this film, obviously, but I think studying in greater detail this question of what went wrong with financial regulation in the you know, pre-2008 period that allowed all these um, problems to, to build to the scale that they did. Um, 
is, is just a super important one. I mean, you know, there's been plenty of reporting over the years of, you know, banks could basically choose their regulator, decide whether to be a thrift or whether to be a chartered as a bank. And um, essentially competition among regulators to, 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 to be the lightest regulator who, uh, you know, banks would sign up with you. I mean, that's bizarre, but that, that happened. Uh, the idea that, you know, we had all these non-bank entities that were barely regulated at all. The fact that AIG built up this insanely huge pool of, of financial risk that did, did you guys have any idea of that before this thing started? I mean, no. Uh, <laughs> they know. were, in theory, supervised by the Office of Thrift Supervision, as well as the New York State Insurance. Uh, you know, it, it's now, now look, Dodd Frank did a lot of uh, you know a lot more monitoring and a lot more tools to to monitor that. Uh, you know, the entire shadow banking system, which involves all types of you know money market mutual funds, all types of things that were huge pools of risk in the economy that were not properly studied and understood and and reined in when when necessary. Uh, and that's what ties back to the CFPB, CFPB question. It's amazing to me that the reaction not that far later is to uh, try and hack away at some of this stuff. I you know if you'd asked me in 2008 in the heat of this, okay, there'll be a big bill in 2010. Uh, what do you think the next election will, what, what direction will things point? I certainly wouldn't guess that um, it would be hacking away some of the stuff. One thing I want to say, though, about, about, in particular about regulatory shopping, that was thought to be a feature, not a bug. So, so there were a lot of proponents of, of that system that that actually disciplined regulators for not being overly onerous. So ju- just to say that um, some of this stuff was on purpose. But that was kind of shock uh, when you asked. You know, I keep thinking now, like, oh yeah, what, what the the choosing your regulator seems like a very bizarre kind of concept. I'm sure economically there's some reason to make sense, but but it did that struck me when then when I was asking questions of those guys, I thought that seems like an odd thing. And you want to answer the question about yeah, why now? Yeah, to get to that, why now? Um, I mean, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, I think that there's a, uh, a desire to kind of do a forensic on the last election, try to figure out well, how did we get to where we are today with populism in this country and division and deep division and um, and I wanted to explore those ideas you know and sort of figure out well how you know how did we get where we are um, obviously it's 10 years since the financial crisis so we you know we wanted to kind of come out around that period and sort of look back um, it happened to be at this point because I was making another film in Korea at the time so I had to kind of wait so there was a little bit of lag time so that's just a practical sort of Point. But I do think it's important to look back. You know, I'm always moved when I see, and there's a moment in the film when Mitch McConnell is standing next to Nancy Pelosi, and they're talking about solving this problem. I just can't imagine that happening today. I just, you know, I, I hope that it can. I mean, all the same players. It's kind of remarkable that Nancy's up again for to be Speaker of the House. You know, it's it's like, you know, it's amazing. I, I make a lot of historical films. But I'm always amazed at how you know you sort of history repeats itself over and over again. Well, on that optimistic or pessimistic note, (laughs) uh, depending on how you read it, uh, we've gone way over. But thank you so much for sticking around. I really appreciate it. And thank you to our panel. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.